I think, not just in wrestling, but sports in general, the words like legend, icon, superstar can sometimes get thrown out there a little too liberally, a little too loosely. There's a variety of reasons for that, but it is what it is. It's our nature to always crown the next best thing. But very rarely do people actually live up to that billing. Are they really truly the definition of superstar, legend, icon? And I think beyond question, everyone can agree that on Wednesday, the professional wrestling world lost a true, true legend and icon in the business with the passing of Bruno San Martino at the age of 82. And I took to Twitter on Wednesday and posted a couple of things about his passing and his impact and, and the way I th always thought about Bruno San Martino was that in a lot of ways he was the personification of the American dream that you hear so much about that gets propagandized and all of that but Bruno really was the personification of the American dream realized here's a guy that was born in Italy under the fascist reign of Benito Mussolini, who, while his dad was already here in the States before the war had even begun, during the war, his mom, his other siblings that had actually survived, lost several of his siblings uh, before and during the war, they hid in the mountains, basically, from the Nazis. His mom would go sneak into the town and try to bring food back to him. And sometimes she came with something and sometimes she didn't. So they're eating grass and they're eating snow. Whatever it took to survive. Eventually, Bruno, his mom, and his other siblings make it to America in 1950. He's a scrawny, skinny, sickly kid, as he's he talked about over the years. You know, with what he dealt with during the wartime in Italy, he comes to the U.S. And of course, a guy, a kid, all of like 15 years of age or so, speaks absolutely no English. So he's got that against him. He's an immigrant speaking only Italian. Got that against him. He's a sickly little small kid. Got that against him as well. He got bullied. And instead of just sitting there and taking it and accepting his plot in life and saying, woe is me, he did something about it. He got into weightlifting. He got into powerlifting. This is a guy that came really close to qualifying for the U.S. Olympic team in 1956 as a weightlifter. This is a guy that I believe it was in 58 or 59, actually set the world bench press record at 565 pounds. And for a guy that was all of 5'10", 265 pounds, I mean, he was a short, stocky, muscular dude, but he put up 565 pounds without the benefits of steroids and modern medicine and the scientific way we look at working out and weightlifting and such today. He was a beast. He was a powerhouse. Eventually, he found his true life's calling. He found his calling in life when he entered the professional wrestling business. And after a couple of years of trying to find his place and kind of toiling around and even being on the outs at one point in time with Vince McMahon Sr., believe it or not, eventually he found his place. And in 1963, he beat the WWF champion, Buddy Rogers, to begin a title reign that lasted almost eight damn years. I want you to think about this. Like, was it, it might have even been more than eight years. I know it was 2,803 days total. You could do the math. Just think about that for a second. The dude held the belt for almost seven years. He was the top guy in a territory, a big, important territory in the Northeast that included the New York market and everything in that immediate area, Baltimore, what have you. 
he was a big enough star, a big enough draw, to where a company felt like they could legitimately make a nice profit with him as their world champion for almost seven years. I cannot emphasize again how crazy that is. From 63 through the end of the decade and into early 71, he was the guy. You will never, ever see that in any type of reputable wrestling promotion ever again. I can promise you that. In our instant gratification, lose interest quickly type of society, three months can be a long title reign. If you think about it, three months can be. You get to six months and people are itching for the trigger to be pulled. Christ sakes, this guy held the belt for almost seven years. And then after he dropped it and it was off him for a little while, he came back, got it a second time and held it for over 1,200 days, another three plus years. So think about that. This guy between the 60s and the 70s was the WWF champion for over 11 total years. He was a massive star in New York in the WWF. I mean, to this day, you ask people in their 50s, 60s, 70s that might crap on wrestling and hate wrestling and think it's stupid, they still love Bruno San Martino. As you go back and watch the old clips from him, Bruno is Uno is the sign that you would see, and people believed in this man. He is truly one of the great baby faces in the history of professional wrestling. He takes a back seat to no one, including Hogan, in terms of being historically the greatest baby face in WWF slash WWF slash WWE history. He takes a back seat to nobody. And when you think about the history of the company and the history of the professional wrestling business, you don't get Hogan in the global expansion of the 80s without Bruno laying the foundation. You don't later on get the Attitude Era and Austin and The Rock and all the greatness that happened then without the foundation that was laid by the real superstar, the real legend, the real icon, Bruno San Martino. Like even when Mr. Bob Backlund was the champion for almost six damn years. It was Bruno San Martino and Larry Zbysko that were drawing the most money in 1980 with their feud of the year that ultimately had that blow off at Shea Stadium. And they drew 36 plus thousand damn people. Contrary to what Hogan might believe, they weren't the draw. It was Bruno, end of discussion. And I want you to think about this. The NWA champ had the luxury of being able to travel all over the place. So yeah, those guys, you would vote on the convention every year and these guys might hold the title for a year, maybe two, maybe three. But they didn't always have to stick in one spot for any length of time. So their act didn't get stale. Their act didn't get repetitive. Bruno didn't have that benefit. He largely had to stay within that Northeast Territory. So he was swinging through a couple of times a year, every year, for almost a damn decade as the champion and the people kept coming. Madison Square Garden is as much Bruno San Martino's house as it is anybody else. And that is not just trying to pump a dude full of smoke because he's passed away. That is the truth. And for me, unfortunately... I wasn't able to see Bruno, obviously, in his prime and during his career when he was that star. It's all about looking at the history, going back and watching old stuff, uh, hearing old fans talk about Bruno, but you can get it, you can see it, and you can sense it, you could see just how much the people truly loved Bruno. His ability to connect is second to none and always will be. Always will be. And it was so heartbreaking for a long period of time, 20 plus years, to see Bruno and Vince McMahon have this real blood feud. And Bruno's going out and talking all this trash about the company. Legitimate and sometimes not. Sometimes it's bitter, sour grapes. And Vince McMahon sitting there and calling him a bitter old man who's mad that the business passed him by. And all of these years, you're like, 
at some point in time, something's got to give. Because again, you cannot tell the history of professional wrestling. And more importantly for Vince, you cannot tell the history of your company without the guy who dominated the place for two damn decades. Like you think about Hogan and his global expansion, that first title reign that lasted you know, a little bit over four years from January 23rd, 1984 to February 5th, 1988. So over four years. Bruno had another several years on top of that. That's insane. So it warmed my heart and made me so happy when we got the news in 2013 that you're going to be in the New York, New Jersey area and Bruno San Martino is going to take his rightful place in the WWE Hall of Fame. Because I can even remember asking Bill Apter in Waterloo, Iowa in 2012. I'm like, do you think next year could be the year? Do you think Bruno's going to finally let it go? Do you think Vince is going to come to his senses? And Bill Apter, friends with Bruno, knew him for years, didn't think it was possible. He said, I can't ever see it happening. But it did. And to me, to this day, for all the things Triple H has done in the business and with WWE that you can praise, that you can criticize, to me, one of the most important things, one of the best symbolic things, one of the most significant things he has ever done was to bring Bruno San Martino back home. That, to me, is as great of an accomplishment as anything else because literally people thought he was going to his grave still hating Vince McMahon and professional wrestling and the business that he helped make that left him behind. So it was awesome to see him there at WrestleMania 29, getting the adulation and the admiration of the fans that he so rightly deserved. He was a hero in that area, and he still is to this day. He's still a beloved hometown figure in Pittsburgh just as much as the Steel Curtain Steelers are of the 70s or Sid the Kid is today. And that personally, even getting past the years of bitterness that were lost and the sour grapes and everything else, there was always something to me about a guy like Bruno San Martino, who you could tell loved the professional wrestling business, went to his dying days still trying to protect the professional wrestling business as much as he could for years he would still try to sit there and protect it as much as possible and keep kayfabe alive and keep kayfabe alive. And while on the one hand you're like, oh, you crazy old bastards, you got to realize the times have changed. There's also always been something so admirable to me about guys like him and the Vern Gagne's of the world and the Luthezes of the world that fought it as long as they could. And you could tell that they didn't just love wrestling. Wrestling was their life. Their life was wrestling. Wrestling was them. And you see a guy like Bruno, who was an honorable, decent, hardworking type of guy, who overcame almost insurmountable odds to make a great life, a great career, and a great way for him and his family. He had been married to his wife for almost 60 years, raised a few kids. He wasn't a guy you heard about getting in legal trouble or any of that. To me, in a world where we often prop up people as heroes and they don't deserve that worship, and it's sad that we give them that platform, I look at a guy like a Bruno San Martino and I feel like he's somebody that current and future generations should look to as an example. He is somebody that showed us what is possible if you believe and if you dream. Bruno San Martino was a hero, is a hero, and always will be a hero. And it's great that in the later years of his life, and especially now, unfortunately, with his passing, that people are treating him like the hero he always has been and always will be. Rest in peace, Bruno. Bruno is uno. Never forget it.